Hello, a good day to you, depending on where you join us from today. A heartfelt welcome to, to the session, the role of party autonomy in international commercial contracts. My name is Ning Zhao, the head con uh, senior legal officer at the Hague Conference on Private International Law. Today, I'm very honored to have a chat with the Honorable Justice David Goddard from the Court of Appeal New Zealand on this interesting topic. David has tons of practical experience in this area. Before becoming a judge, he was a successful and well-respected uh, lawyer and arbitrator. David was also the chair of the 22nd diplomatic session of the HCCH, which led to the successful adoption of the 2019 Judgments Convention, which set up an international framework for the recognition and in, uh, enforcement of foreign judgment. Here is a very important update. The Judgments Convention will enter into force on 1st September 2023, four years after its adoption. So hello, De David. Um, thank you for joining me today. You must be very excited by the recent development of the Judgments Convention, right? Hi, Ning. Yes, it's it's a great pleasure to be talking with you. Uh, bright and early in the morning in The Hague, I think for you, and on a rather chilly uh, spring evening uh, here in New Zealand for me. Um, yes, it's very exciting to get the news that the Judgments Convention will be coming into force. Uh, next year, that's a yeah, that's a really fabulous uh, waypoint uh, to reach uh, in what I hope ultimately will be a very important uh, global convention. But now, at least, we have a firm date for it to begin to be operative. Yeah. Okay. Now we first put aside the judgments convention for a moment uh, and get back to the topic of the this session. Uh, could you? please provide an overview of what is meant by party autonomy in the field of private international law. Well, when we talk about party autonomy in the private international law context, we have in mind two particular aspects of the broader concept of freedom of contract. The first of these things is the ability of the parties to choose the dispute resolution mechanism that will apply in connection with their contract and any disputes that may arise under it or in relation to it. Uh, that is their ability to choose whether to litigate before a court or go to arbitration. And if they're going to go to a court, their ability to choose which court or courts will hear a dispute. Uh, the second, the second aspect is the ability of the parties to choose the law, uh, which may be state law or non-state rules of law that will govern their contractual relationship, the rules that will govern its interpretation of the agreement, uh, the consequences of breach, a whole range of issues of that kind. Now, now in each case, uh, the purpose of the clause is to provide certainty and predictability for the parties about which law to apply when determining the party's obligations in connection with the contract, both while it's on foot, if any issues arise and they want to know what they're required to do, and in the event of litigation and also about the forum in which any dispute that may arise will be resolved. I mean, these, these clauses are enormously important. They're often reached fairly late in a negotiation. I think you've spoken uh, to me about them as midnight clauses uh, uh, because they get reached so late, and that's true. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not important, particularly in the world we live in today where transactions, people, assets, uh, can so easily uh, cross borders. Uh, and, and that's well understood, right? So there are uh, already a number of instruments uh, uh, in these fields which establish regional uh, or international global frameworks uh, or aim at harmonization. And for example, um, uh, in 2005, uh, the HCCH adopted the Choice of Court Convention um, that's a convention about exclusive choice of court agreements. That entered into force in 2015, and it now applies, I think, to some 32 HCCH members. Um, and then, of course, in 2019, the HCCH adopted the Judgments Convention that you've just mentioned, uh, which contains some very important rules relevant to choice of court clauses as well, non-exclusive choice of court clauses, and also declining to recognise and enforce judgments entered inconsistently with a choice of court agreement. 
And as you said, that convention also will now enter into force on 1 September next year. And then, of course, critically in this context as well, in 2015, the HCCH adopted a, a very important, I think, soft law instrument, the HCCH Principles on Choice of Law in International Commercial Contracts. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, uh, David, thank you for, for the insight. Indeed, um, we want to know from the perspective of your different roles, including in legal practice, as an arbitrator and as a judge, how important do you consider party autonomy is in international commercial contracts? Is there a need for harmonization at the international and regional levels? Well, it is very important to parties and in order to uh, achieve the goals that parties are aiming at when they agree on governing law, when they agree on a forum, it's really important that they're able to predict with some confidence in advance that their choices will be respected. So the more accessible we can make the law through harmonization or through global frameworks, and the more effective we can make those choices, the more effective uh, we make those tools. I mean, if we step back and ask, why does party autonomy matter? It matters because commercial contracts are mechanisms for allocation of risk between the parties. That's what they do. If the parties can't be certain that their allocation of commercial risk will be effective, especially when things get difficult, uh, if and when disputes arise, then the contract can't serve that core function and the parties can't rely on it with confidence. If they can't agree on the law to govern the contract, on the ground rules, if they can't agree on the forum where disputes will be resolved, they can't be confident that the substantive provisions of the agreement will be given the effect intended and you know which uh, they based their, their dealings on. Should also say actually, uh, Ning, that clauses of this in kind have really significant implications for the cost of resolving disputes and the timeframes for resolving disputes. Um, of course, once a dispute arises, one or other party may want to delay dispute resolution or game the process. But if you ask commercial parties on day one entering into an agreement, uh, uh, whether they want to spend time and money arguing about what law governs their agreement or arguing about where any dispute will be resolved, I think you can be pretty confident that any rational commercial parties will say, no, of course not. Uh, uh, the idea that we'll waste money and time arguing about how we'll resolve our dispute before we even get on with resolving the dispute uh, is the opposite of what you know, most commercial parties would ever want to achieve. So it's, it's really important uh, for commercial parties, if they're going to deal with confidence across borders, that clauses of this kind be given effect. And the best way to achieve that and to make it clear they will is through international coordination, firmly of that view. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, now, just you mentioned the choice of court clauses and the choice of law clauses in the international commercial contracts. So now, based on your experience, um, could you please share with us about the interrelation between choice of law and choice of court in New Zealand or any other jurisdictions that you are familiar with? Sure. Well, I mean, in principle, and I think this is quite important, the two types of clause are quite independent. It's not at all unusual in international commercial transactions to see a choice of the law of country A to govern the agreement, coupled with an agreement to litigate in country B or to arbitrate in country C, or sometimes to arbitrate in country C, except for certain matters which will be resolved by litigation in country B. You can have all of those, <laughs> and, and there may be perfectly good commercial reasons for doing that. Um, they're different um, in ways that are recognised by the 2015 Choice of Law Principles as well. Article 4 provides that a choice of forum clause is not equivalent to a choice of law. That is, a court can't and shouldn't reason that a choice to litigate disputes before the courts of country X means that the parties have chosen the law of country X to govern the agreement. And that approach is consistent with the law of New Zealand and other common law countries with which I'm familiar. It doesn't follow from a choice of forum that you've got a choice of law. It's a separate question. Uh, it, it is true that in the absence of a choice of law clause, the choice of the courts of country X to determine disputes under the contract may be a factor, one factor, that will be taken into account in determining whether there's an implied choice of law or if there's no choice, express or implied, 
in determining the applicable law based on which country's laws the contract is most closely connected with. But it doesn't follow automatically from one to the other. And it's not at all unusual for a court to conclude uh, that despite the choice um, uh, to litigate in country X, the governing law is some other law. Um, Works the other way around too. In the absence of a choice of forum, the presence of a choice of law clause that selects the law of country Z um, as the governing law of a contract won't be treated in common law countries as a choice of forum clause or as a submission uh, to jurisdiction. Uh, they wouldn't qualify as choice of court clauses for the purposes of the choice of court or judgments uh, conventions. Again, though, I um, sh should mention that a choice of the law of country Z uh, in an agreement to govern an agreement may make it easier in some countries, including New Zealand, for a claimant to serve proceedings filed in the courts of country Z on a party outside that country. Uh, for example, in New Zealand, if you've got a choice of New Zealand law, then that will enable proceedings to be served abroad without leave. You don't have to ask the court first. But the question of whether New Zealand is the appropriate forum will still remain to be resolved. Um, and the choice of the law of a country to govern the party's dealings is a factor, but a very weak factor in the assessment of which court is most appropriate to hear and determine a dispute if those questions arise. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. So based on what you shared with us, so you would recommend that the party should make a clear choices in practice, right? So whether it's a choice of court or choice of law clauses for the sake of legal certainty and clarity and predictability. So as you have yeah. mentioned, Right. Yeah. As you have mentioned, the HCCH already has instruments right, promoting party autonomy, uh, which aim at enhancing uh, access to justice and facilitating international trade and investment. So are the HCCH instruments concerning party autonomy relevant in New Zealand? A firm yes, I think, and then uh, to that one as well. Um, mm. Definitely when it comes to choice of court and judgments, New Zealand is not yet a party to either of those instruments, um, but I would very much like New Zealand ex to accede to both in the near future, and they're very much designed as a package that countries will you know, logically accede to together, uh, uh, ju choice of court and judgments. Uh, it's necessary to be a contracting state to obtain the full benefit of those instruments. And then, of course, we come to the principles. Um, it's not an instrument you can accede to, but it's a, a very helpful, I think, codification of some basic principles in this space. New Zealand's uh, law on choice of court uh, is common law. Um, it's not uh, at all uh, codified. It would make the law much more accessible if we were to codify it. Uh, and there are aspects of the law, uh, if we sat down to codify it, where we would say, well, actually, we don't know really for sure what the law is now, aspects that are uncertain and require clarification. One of my favourite examples, which uh, you know, is the ability to choose non-state rules of law to govern a contract. It's quite clear you can do that if you're referring your disputes to arbitration and it will be effective in the arbitration context. But there's actually real doubt about whether that's possible if you're agreeing to refer your disputes to determination before a court. But I, I, mean, I myself can't see why that should make a difference. So there are issues like that <laughs> that we should um, deal with, I think, in a codification to improve the certainty of the law, to improve its accessibility. And I think the 2015 principles would provide a helpful model, uh, a good starting point for a project of that kind. Uh, I'm pretty sure that same is true in many other countries uh, in my region, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, and globally. Yeah, thank you, uh, David. Um, now, last but not least, and <laughs> a question: um, In which areas or on what aspect of a choice law rules do you think more work is needed at the international level? Mm. There are a number of possible areas of work. Um, I think the HCCH approach of working on soft law instruments in this field is a good one. I'd like to see more work done on that. I think it will make it much easier to reach consensus. And the area that I'd like to see some work on, I, I know this was considered you know, uh, once before, uh, but, but I do think it would be useful, is some work on the law that applies to a contract in the absence of an express choice of law. 
Um, I think it should be possible to expand the 2015 principles, given that it's soft law, to add some principles to govern this rather common scenario. You know, a moment ago, Ning, you asked me if I'd advise people to include clauses on this. I would, but there are all sorts of people out there who are not taking that advice. <laughs> uh, uh, it's quite common to see contracts that don't contain a choice of law clause. And the analytical uh, process that applies in New Zealand and other common law countries uh, in that scenario is a rather unsatisfactory uh, and slightly confusing one. I think we can do better and I think international coordination in that space to try to encourage more harmonisation to reduce risk for parties who haven't included such a clause at the time when their disputes arise so they have a better sense of what will happen then uh, would be really valuable. Yes, right. Um, many thanks, um, David, for your precious time for, for this conversation. Uh, this is a very interesting discussion. Indeed, it is useful and important to stress the importance of a party autonomy in international commercial contracts, right, in legal practice and in arbitration. And choice law and choice court clauses should be drafted clearly to provide legal certainty and predictability, even though, some, as you just mentioned, sometimes people don't do it, but it is strongly advised to do so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, while there are already international instruments in place and uh, for conventions, we, we heard that the 2005 Church Court Convention and 2019 Judgments Convention, you encourage and actually we will encourage states to join these conventions to benefit the international framework set up there under for their citizens and business. And also, as you stated, David, and the 2015 principles, choice of law principles, can be expanded to cover default choice of law rules in the absence of a party's choice. Yeah, I I'm sure you will agree also with me that, um, David, we will continue this dialogue and to promote this instrument and to raise awareness and to raise the importance and the usefulness and the benefit of this instrument for the society uh, as a whole. Um, many thanks, David, again, and thank you for your time. And this is the end of the session, and we hope you continue enjoying the Codify conference. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thank Good you, David. Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> A good day, continue, everyone. <laughs>